It's time for Windows Weekly. Paul Thorat is here, and he has found a significant bug in Windows 7. Microsoft knows about it, but they don't want to do anything about it. What's the story? We'll find out next on Windows Weekly. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Windows Weekly is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Windows Weekly with Paul Thorat, episode 203, recorded April 7th, 2011. The ROMs are out there. Windows Weekly is brought to you by Go to Assist Express. If you're an IT or software consultant, up your competitive edge and grow your business with Go to Assist Express. For a free 30-day trial, visit gotoassist.com slash windows. And by audible.com. To download the free audiobook of your choice, go to audible.com slash windows. And by FreshBooks. The easy online invoicing service that gets you paid quickly and makes you look more professional. Get started with a free package at FreshBooks.com. It's time for Windows Weekly, the show that covers the latest news from Redmond, Washington. And here he is, as far away from Redmond as you can get and still be in the continental United States, Mr. Paul Thorat. He's actually craning his head to get even farther away. I have a... <laughs> Headset mishap occurring here. Oh, do you want do you want me to take a break while you fix it? We are already no, fifteen good. seconds into the show. It it'd certainly be appropriate. <laughs> it's time for an appropriate time for a Let's break. Let's go to commercial, shall Let's, we? <laughs> Let's go to commercial. Uh, you know, I left an important topic off of the list today. I think let me just check. Yep. Well, you just stick it in wherever you want, Paul. Phrasing. <laughs> so, Paul, Paul is the editor in chief. Let's change subjects. Paul is the editor in chief of the super site for Windows, windowsupersite.com. Uh, he is a uh, yeah. news editor for Windows IT Pro, analyst for Penton Media, the author of this. And I never know which book I'm going to get when I re reach back here to uh, the author of Windows 7 Phone 7 Secrets, Windows 7 Secrets, and the Delphi Super Bible 3. Wow. I, wow. I'll tell you, more people know about that book now than when it was worthwhile. <laughs> you see, if you'd been doing this show, you could have sold a few more copies. I know. Yeah, we should have been doing this show back in 1922. <clears throat> I think um, when I wrote the book, it was prohibitively expensive to even put an MP3 album on a hard drive. So oh, probably. I'm not sure yeah. I'm not sure this show would have really been a big wow. deal <laughs> <laughs> at that time, you know. So um, do you, you said you have something. Uh, is this urgent? you want to get it in right now? Yeah, or? we might as well throw it in first. Right. You know. A week ago, IDC surprised the world when they said that they expected yes. Windows Phone to become the number two smartphone platform in the world. A lot of giggles over that one. Yeah. Well, now Gartner has come up with their own study, and they found exactly the same thing. Really? Yeah. They are also predicting that Windows Phone will be the number two smartphone platform in the world by 2015, uh, ahead of the iPhone. Well, then it must, be, it must be true. Uh, well, <laughs> I guess. I mean, I, I think... Obviously, predictions like this are going to change over time, you know, and, and the one thing that Gartner said that I don't think IDC explicitly said was that, look, we expect, by, in fact, they explicitly say, solely by virtue of Microsoft's alliance with Nokia, we have revised our forecast of Windows Phone uh, market share upward. Um, they expect that the performance will go downhill from what Sabian had achieved in the past, but that it would be enough to put Windows Phone over the top, so to speak, for the second position but i actually think that the symbian stuff is going to implode a lot more than that and that nokia's brand as, as strong as it may be isn't really enough uh to make that happen the other thing i would point out is that symbian is or rather nokia has been talking a lot about the low end of the market especially in places outside of the first tier countries with regards to smartphone sales like the united states and western europe and so forth and that a lot of the expected business that they're going to have is going to come from developing nations and uh, from places where people just don't have a lot of money. And Windows Phone right now, as you may know, is positioned at the high end of the market. It is a, a high-end smartphone. It's a luxury smartphone. It is, um, you know, it's not a mid-level or mid-tier kind of platform. Obviously, it's going to evolve over time. But if the end result is this sort of pseudo, 
feature phone version of Windows Phone, which I guess maybe would almost have to happen for this to, you know, become the case. Uh, you know, again, we get into that uncomfortable territory, which we get into with Symbian today, which is that a lot of those Symbian sales, I don't feel, fall into the smartphone category. Well, it's interesting. But, I mean, it, I just, it does show the strength that these analysts, um, uh, you know, grant to Nokia. And I guess the reason it seems kind of hard to believe to us here in the U.S. is that Nokia has long ago lost its lost so much ground in the U.S. I mean, it really was dominant 10 years ago. Yeah, but what they're talking, they're talking about the world, it's right? It's global, so, exactly. Yeah, Globally, this there's is, still um, a powerhouse. Right. So we'll see. I mean, again, you know, just coming from the United States, I don't necessarily have a handle on how popular Nokia is elsewhere. So, you know, maybe they're right, I guess. Um, it sort of reminds me of the soccer argument. You know, a lot of people in the United States can't stand soccer. Right. But doesn't mean it's but, not the number one game in the world. Yeah, it also doesn't mean that it's a hard, not a horrible game, by the way. But, you know, whatever. I mean, I just don't, uh, we don't get it here. We're not right. interested in it here. It's just the way it is. And um, I do remember, yeah. you know, going through Charles de Gaulle in Paris and seeing mm -hmm. so many Nokia ads for the C7. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, I Nokia actually, ads were all over Madrid when I was there yeah. two, uh, months ago, a month but ago. But I fell for it. <laughs> And as, yeah. as you remember, I bought an N8 a few months ago because that's the top. Oh no! Line. Listen, Nokia um, I, I, smart, smart I understand smart. that. I when Microsoft announced an, uh, an alliance with Nokia, not the the current one, the the original one or the earlier one, yeah. they were going to put Office on Nokia phones. Remember? Right. And yeah, I thought to myself, on Symbian, it never yeah. happened, by the way. Yeah. But I thought at the time, this is going to have to be a new area of focus because obviously Nokia is the biggest phone manufacturer in the world. This is a huge deal. This is a great way to expand the office brand into another huge computing market, you know, it's a really big deal. But then nothing came of this, nothing. So, yeah, I'm sure that phone is beautiful looking. But, it's a beautiful, yes. I'm going to bring yeah. it back. If, oh, it's upstairs. I'll, I'll run up and get it uh, at the next break. Yeah. It's, um, it's gorgeous. It's a little clunky. I mean, it looks uh, kind of like a space vehicle. Uh, yep. 12 megapixel camera. That was something that kind of Which won me over. Which is crazy, by the way. Crazy and very good camera. Yeah. But... And I love Symbian. I know. I want to say this because I'll tell you, I get the hate mail when I say anything negative mm -hmm. about Symbian. Oh, I know. I do too. I was a. I had a Scion 3A. It was the best little pocket computer computer I ever had. I would. You know, I, in some ways, I wish they still made it. Um, yeah, but when you had that, uh, Miami Vice was still on yes, TV. Yes, exactly. So. I wore I wore orange shirts <laughs> yeah. and I had a mustache. It was a long time, exactly, because <laughs> but, you had to. because you had because everybody did. But yeah. uh, that and that was my impression of the N7 is n nicely made. If this yeah. had come out, if I had this in 2005, I would have gone, hey, this is cool. But it's not 2005. It's 2011. Yeah. And it just, so yeah. I understand why Nokia Windows did Phone what is they great. Did. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I think. No, they, but that's why they did what they did. Windows Phone is modern, at least. It is modern. It is beautiful. And, and we'll see what they do with it. I mean, I, it, the dream, of course, is to have one device, you know, that you could bring around with you. And, uh, a smartphone with a 12 megapixel camera on it. I mean, how awesome is that? Um, and obviously, they're known for their optics and the quality of the optics and the software around the camera and all that. So neat. But we're going to have to wait and see. Yeah, I, 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 I'm sorry. I'm skeptical, especially because the, no, reason, I am so. the reason Nokia has done so well worldwide is not its smartphones, but its cheap candy bar phones. Um, and I, I mean, admittedly, if if you're in Sri Lanka, you don't, you know, you don't maybe have the same standards for what a smartphone needs to be, mm -hmm. but I just I think if they if they have the choice, things maybe are going to evolve. But I don't think that you know uh, the 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 ability of the third world to buy smartphones isn't going to evolve. You know, we throw a hundred dollars a month on average. I bet at AT and T every month, uh, the typical smartphone customer, whether you're on iPhone or Android or Windows Phone or whatever, that's the cost. Right, you and know? you're not going to see that worldwide. No. So this is the, uh, I, I had Alex uh, go up and get me the uh, the Nokia N7. I mean, mm -hmm. it's a little clunky, you know, um, because, for instance, this sticks out. There's a little... Is it actual metal? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Hard to tell, but yeah, it feels, seems like brush. Feels metal, yeah. Brushed, That's metal nice. Brushed, mm -hmm. It's well made. Quality. It's Quality. Nice screen, you know. Um, it's it's thick. It's thicker, you know, if you compare it this to, thick. like, the uh, N, N, the uh, Nexus 1, um, it's thicker and heavier. Is it's there any kind of? There's no hardware keyboard, so it's really it's just thick. It's just, it's, just, it's thick for no reason. It's thick, but it, with a quality. Yeah. It, well, but sometimes thickness and weight lends an air of quality, right? The original drawer was. Feel, like that. Yeah, no, it does feel it strong. thick and heavy, but 
It has, um, as I said, a good camera. This is the Symbian OS, which is mm. pretty modern, but not responsive. You see, I, made, I had to swipe yeah. three times to kind of, yeah. it just, it doesn't, it's, it's not responsive. There's all kinds of things that go into responsiveness, but that quality of the screen, it was the, thing, it was one of those, it was one of many things that the, uh, that Apple got right with the iPhone, right? And even after the iPhone was out for a couple of years, you would still come across phones where you would do what you just did. We'd try to swipe on the screen and yeah. you have to kind of push down a little harder to make yeah. it happen. Or it's, it's interesting to me that people are still getting this wrong. Yeah, exactly. Uh, frankly, it, it's just not usable. It's, it's yeah. old, it's old school. It is. Yeah. I think the iPhone, uh, is the king of the hill. Um, I think that, yeah, I, I think that, uh, you, you know, Android's going to be out there and making lots of Android's gonna be making lots of cheap phones. I think, I think that's one of the things that may change this, uh, well, I would say Android is like the PC, and this is uh, people are going to think this is too simplistic, but it's really true because it's going to be a range of phones from the cheap phones you're talking about all the way up to like the equivalent of a gaming PC. Exactly. Where you have that, that very high end phone, you know? Exactly. And plus, uh, just through the sheer number of uh, OEMs and, and hardware makers and so forth, you're going to have lots and lots of choices, and they're going to be able to uh, just attack new markets very quickly or new technologies. Like 4G, for example. Right, and uh, well, you know, yeah. I, well, I like some Windows Phone Seven a lot. I think it's yeah. a great OS. Uh, well, it, but I do too. But you know, I mean, not to get off on a, I don't mean to get off on a rant here. I don't know if I've complained about Windows Phone yet, Leo. But you know, Windows Phone splits the difference between the iPhone and and uh, Android. So there's more choice. Well, I agree. But they don't move as quickly into these new technologies as Android does, and that kind of stinks. So you get some of the benefit, but not all of it. You know, you get some of the the better quality that you get around the iPhone because the iPhone is obviously a single manufacturer and there's advantages to that. Um, so Microsoft has a much more cohesive core platform that they require everyone to adhere to than Android does. Um, so you get a little bit of the benefit of the, the iPhone there, but not all of the benefit because it still isn't one manufacturer. I, I think uh, Microsoft plus Nokia maybe will give us a step closer to that iPhone ideal. Here's uh, where, but again, that's in the future. To me, what it comes down to, mm -hmm. in the U.S., I think they don't have a chance. Not Microsoft. Yeah, Windows Nokia. Phone. Windows. Well, Nokia. Nokia. Yeah, okay. Windows Phone yeah. has Windows Phone will be a you know a number three for a long time. The real mm -hmm. this I think this this particular prognostication from IDC and now from Gartner is yeah. relying on international sales, and I think to make it in it the is, international well, right. To make it international sales, you have to be able to make a cheap smartphone, and mm -hmm. I don't think you can do it with Windows Phone 7 because so, it requires too much hardware. Yeah, you're correct. And in fact, I didn't see this with Gartner, uh, and, and it may be there. I don't mean to say it's not there. I just didn't see it. Um, but it, with IDC in particular, when they came out with this, you know, the story wasn't Windows Phone will be number two. The, the, the story was IDC predicts where the smartphone world is going to be in 2015, and they had international as well as U.S.-based market share expectations. I don't know why my... You see how my screen goes light and then dark and... Yes. I don't know why that happens. It's the shadow of Satan passing over your roof. No, there's no, there's no actual change of lighting in the room at all. I haven't... The, my screen hasn't changed. The lighting hasn't changed. I don't know why that happens. Computers, anyway. What are you going to do? <laughs> uh, well, I had someone say to me that they noticed this happening and it was clearly because I was reading something on the screen or something and that's not oh, the, the case. Oh, the screen goes I, on and off. No, but that's not I the haven't, case. I haven't touched the screen. It's not that. So... Whatever could it be? <laughs> I don't know. It's the Windows Phone gremlins. Um, it is true that IDC predicts that uh, number one, two, and three in the U.S. will be Android, iPhone, and then Windows Phone in that order. And that worldwide, they're saying it's going to be Android, Windows Phone, right. and then iPhone. So, and I would agree with that. That makes sense. And, 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 you know, to think about Apple in this context, you know, this is the way things go. U.S. versus worldwide for them as well, where they're much more popular in the United States than they are right. worldwide simply because the United States is a big tier one market with money. And uh, when you factor in international sales, worldwide sales, you're talking a lot about, uh, you know, it's the whole world. So yeah, the a lot of these is markets a first just don't have world money. phone. Yes. But I would submit that so is the Windows phone. Oh, no, you're right. They're both in the today, but that's what I'm saying. In other words, for this to be true, for, for Gartner and, I, and IDC to be correct, uh, Nokia has said they intend to go aggressively after this. They didn't say the third world, but the underdeveloped nations and the lower end of the market. That means that Windows Phone is going to have to evolve. And that the Windows Phone of 2015, the one that has all this market share, is not going to be the high-end market, you know, the high-end right. phone that we see today. It's going to be more like a PC where you have different versions of it, high and low end. I, I Yeah, and of course, uh, 
That's what they're they're betting on. I didn't realize it was 2015. I mean, the IDC thing was next year. But by 2015, no, no, it wasn't. It, it was, oh, yeah, no, it was 2015. 2015. Also. Well, by yep. then, I guess you could say, oh, the chips will be cheaper. You could make a gigahertz phone with enough RAM for a lot mm -hmm. less money. So that's what they're presuming. But well, except that you know, you don't escape the very simple math of the cost of the wireless access, which is the real cost of these right. phones. You know, yes, I get that the hardware is going to be cheaper. You can buy a Focus for 99 cents sometimes, based on sales. That. That that initial cost is that's not nothing. it, is it? No, uh, right. no, no. It's it's always going to be this cost of data, right? And the cost of calling and the cost of texting. You know, this is how those companies get you. Um, well, it's why I just don't see it. Smartphones don't sell well in mm -hmm. poorer areas because they don't want to pay for data; they want texting. Plus, they may not have it. You know, depending. Right. I don't know. I don't know what wireless access is right. like in the middle of Africa, but yeah, it's so probably not exactly. Great. So, what do you need a Windows phone for? You don't. Right. So maybe this is but, making you know, the, some some guesses about how how the world will change by 2050. Well, yeah, yeah, and I don't have this number in front of me, but I, I do have the number for what they expect Windows Phone to sell in 2015. You know, 216 million units just of Windows Phone in one wow. year. Wow. Uh, that's over half the size of the PC market today. They expect uh, Android to sell uh, with, um, by the way, almost 49 percent of the market. 540 million units. <laughs> wow. Just Android phone. That's going to that's gonna make the PC industry look like a joke. Yeah. By comparison. That's a year? Uh, and yes, in one year. 190 wow. million units for the iPhone. Um, so you could add those three things up, and we're looking at uh, a billion units, which is almost three times the size of the PC market today. <sighs> wow. Yeah. yeah and now crazy. you know why Microsoft... Google and Apple are all very interested in this market. It's huge. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gee. Crazy. Oh, man. I mean, Windows Phone may have sold 3 million units. <laughs> you know, right. may. may. I mean, I doubt it has, to be honest, but let's say it has 3 million units. So whatever that works out to be in a year, 5, 6 million units, they, this thing is going to jump from that to 216 million. <laughs> wow. It's crazy. I love it. Yeah. All right, so that was our unexpected special surprise story. <laughs> yes. We now return you to your podcast, which is already in progress. Actually, let's take a break and talk a little bit about our friends at Citrix. <laughs> okay. You know, I, people are saying, oh, maybe it's the white balance, or there is, there might be some auto stuff going on in your camera. I, there absolutely could be. In fact, while you're doing this, I'm going to play with that. Why don't you get under the hood, I'm see what you can it. meth with. Meanwhile, I'll tell everybody... The guys and gals who watch this fine show, I know most of you, many of you anyway, are the people that uh, friends and family run to when they're having trouble with their computer, right? You are the geek, the guru, the, the person in the know. You're in the support business, whether you know it or not. And actually, many of you are literally in the support business. You do IT or you su support software or hardware. Uh, for all of you, all of us who support others... There is a special thing I want you to know about. Something that you can add to your toolkit that will make your life better, easier. It's called Go to Assist Express. Now, I know there are other choices in the remote access, remote support field. But I got to tell you, this is the one I use for a number of reasons. Speed, for sure. Uh, nobody knows remote access better than Citrix. They've got proprietary technology, which makes a huge difference in performance. Security, of course, 128-bit SSL, point-to-point, end-to-end. Mac and PC, that's good. You support a Mac from a PC, a PC from a PC, a PC from a Mac, a Mac from a PC, all of that. Any combination thereof. Uh, and additional features designed for support. Eight sessions at once, unattended sessions. It's very easy for your end user. This is important. If you've got a, a, a somebody you're supporting that isn't experienced, of course, probably they're not, right? You don't want to have to really spend a lot of time supporting them installing the software so you could support the rest of their needs you want to make it easy this is so easy you send them a link they click it they say allow the little java downloads and boom it's done and it's running and it's easy and you're in and you're fixing it and you move on but you don't have to take my word for it. you can try this free go to assist.com slash windows g-o-t-o assist.com slash windows give it a try i think you're gonna like it Free for the next 30 days from the folks at Citrix. Oh, you fixed it. That's fantastic, Paul. So much, so much better. Um, uh, I, need I, help. Think that, I think that'll fix the focus issue. Whoa. 
Uh, that's now why you I look like Scoble Cam. <laughs> yeah, you look like Scoble. <laughs> Do they actually have a button that says Scobleize me? Uh, they should. What camera is oh, that? You're God. having some fun with that. I don't know what's going on here, Leo. I'm just. <laughs> You're green with envy. It's crazy. You know, I think part of the problem is, uh, is that a <laughs> nice wig? For those yeah. of you listening at home, Paul is uh, Paul looks like Marie Antoinette with a uh, five o'clock shadow. <laughs> I'm just is gonna start a, doing the podcast a, like this. That a, what is that? A Teletubby? That is. I don't, good. I don't know what that is. Yeah, it's crazy. That's one of those uh, Japanese. That's good. See, it that's knows good. where your face is. Mm -hmm. It's blurred everything else out. It. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. I, I did make the, a change. We'll I think see. it's the light. I think it's the uh, the window, the bright window behind you. It's confusing the hell out of the. Okay. The camera. Yeah, I can. I gotta put. So I'll put a curtain up or something. Put that yes, not right we are now, fighting back poster there. Yes. Who is that, and why are they fighting? Jim Alchin, Todd Wonky. Those are the guys that worked on Windows XP Service Pack 2. And they're long gone. They're, actually, I think they are all long gone, yeah. Those two are. Anyway. <laughs> Item number two. Once again, Paul has a message. This is like a Propecia ad or something. You know, I feel like um, <laughs> um, I, I'll, what I'll do would be I'll sort of ease into this story because I'll, I'll tell you the story behind the story for me, which is that I've been living with this embarrassing oh. thing for a couple of years now. Is it so an ever itch? since Windows, is it a, would you just yeah, yeah, it's, it like a, a, it's like dry skin rud, or something. Rough, ref, redness. Uh, yeah. Male pattern baldness. <laughs> no, it's, uh, you know, you install Windows 7. Yes, right. Yes. And, and obviously when you reinstall Windows every time, it's awesome right away. And then the way I do it is I have a, a, a small selection of apps that I install right away. And you configure your browser and you do all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And then over time, as you need things, you install them. So I may not install things like, I'm, I have to make something up, like Handbrake or something. Yeah, you wait then, until you need it. And then you, you're right. That's exactly right. You let nature call. Yeah, and I. So what will happen is over time you install stuff, and then eventually I get to this point where I do a lot of work on my desktop. Uh, it's like a scratch pad for me. So when I'm writing an article and I have all the graphics I'm working on, everything I do is saved to the desktop. And then when it's done, I pack it into a folder and I throw it up on the server somewhere. But the the desktop is my scratch pad. So you download. I, you don't download to a download folder. I actually do download oh, okay. to a download folder, but as far as the files I'm working on, you know, just documents, the, just the stuff I'm working on. Right. Yeah, just the stuff I'm working on. And what I've noticed is over time, the desktop stops responding. <laughs> so I'll, I'll have this thing where I'm downloading a file from the web, or I'm copying a file from the server to the hard drive, or I'm copying a file across somewhere, and it's going to land on the desktop. And the system comes to a stop. It actually halts, and I have to wait. Or I'll copy a file to the desktop, and I go to the desktop, and it's not there. But I right-click, and I refresh, and then the file is there, which I find very annoying. Now, over the couple of years that Windows 7 has been out, and not quite a couple of years, but a couple of years counting the beta and the RC version and so forth, I've only had two computers, um, desktop computers, through my home office here. They're both Dells. They're different kinds of Dells. But I, I, was, I was convinced until very recently that... It had something to do with the hardware, maybe a, a device driver related to the uh, display card or the something like that. You know, there was some commonality between the fact that these things were Dells. And uh, I just did a, my SSD makeover, for example. So this computer now, the desktop, is located on the SSD. It's the right. fastest possible drive. So I'm thinking, after two years of this, this will solve the problem. And then the other day it happened again. Ugh. And now once it happens, it just starts happening. Was it an application I installed? You know, one of the culprits I had in the back of my mind was I installed this old Microsoft graphics software. Maybe it's that because it's, it was never written for Windows 7 and it's mm -hmm. out of date. You know, I still use it for various reasons. I don't know. I mentioned this to Raphael and uh, he said, oh, yeah. He goes, this, this is a very well-known bug. This <laughs> happens to people all the time. And I said, really? <laughs> so I looked into it. Now, there's some sort of uh, nicety to that. You know, it's nice knowing that other people are having this problem. But what I've discovered is that people have been reporting this problem since before Windows 7 actually shipped in the, you know, the RTM version. Microsoft has never fixed it. So this is a known bug in Windows 7. There's no real fix. I guess the workaround is you can crash Explorer on purpose you know, uh, through Task Manager, find explorer.exe, end the task, bring it back, 
and then it will work for a while, but it's going to happen again. You know, eventually it happens again, then you have to do it again. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to say, I don't actually have a solution. I'm just bringing it up as a, a topic, and I suspect I'm going to hear from other people that this happens to. And I just want you to know that you're not alone. <laughs> and that this is something that has bedeviled me for, like I said, for about two years now. It's been driving me crazy. And I was convinced this whole time it was me or something I was doing. Is there a fix or a workaround? Or? There's just the workaround. You can just crash Explorer. That's all you can do. And that, and that fixes it for how long? I don't know. Um, but not no set amount of time. I don't, I, I don't understand what causes it. There, there's a, there is a trigger, whether it's a file download or whatever it is, where all of a sudden it just starts happening. Once it happens, you're toast. You know, I could download a file right now because it's happening now. And I'm looking at the desktop and you don't, it doesn't appear, but then you can right click the desktop and there it is. And it's so, it it's so like a broken cache so of some kind. Yeah, I don't know. Isn't it? I do not know. You know, there was the, I remember the, we used to refresh the icon cache, shell icon cache. Yes, yes, yes. And there was a, actually a tweak UI power toy that would do that, that would yeah. fix that for you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now that's yeah, I don't know if it's related to that. It could be. Yeah. yeah, it's very specifically the desktop. It's it's always the desktop. Wow. Well, that's so I found I found all right. I didn't find Raphael found for me a um, a Microsoft uh, you know community board thing dating back to September two thousand nine. Again, before Windows seven actually shipped, where people were complaining about this, and someone from Microsoft says, "Yeah, thanks for reporting this." We know. Yeah, <laughs> you know, we've they've never about fixed. That. Yep. It's, uh, you know, we've decided that's a feature. You've been using yeah. the computer too long. You really should shut it down, go get a breath of fresh air. Actually, that's interesting. So I leave my computer on. It's possible that if you, rebooting the computer would be enough. Yeah, because it sounds I, like a memory leak. Anything that takes, that happens over time. And I, I can't say this for sure. I, obviously, I travel a lot. I, I want to say I... Don't know that I've really noticed this on a laptop. I, it might be just that I can't remember it because the truth is I sit in front of this computer most right. of the time and I sort of associate it with my desktop computers. But it's also odd how it doesn't always happen. You know, it may be a length of use thing. Obviously, with a laptop, you tend to put the thing at least to sleep or do something with it where it's sort of, re, you know, or maybe rebooting more often. I don't know. It's, uh, you know, I'm glad you did mention it. Curtis B. and others in the chat room, not Curtis B., uh, Comp Mike and others in the chat room said, oh, that's been happening to me. I'm glad to know. Oh, I, I guarantee you I'm going to hear from all kinds of people going to say, exactly. I, this has been bugging me. I, you know, I just want to raise it as an issue. Maybe someone from Microsoft is listening and they'll, you know. Maybe someday something. they'll fix it. Maybe they'll fix it in Windows 8. <laughs> <laughs> that's how they tend to do things, too. It's sort of irritating. Well, there's only so far you can go fixing things. <laughs> I guess so. Yeah, it's somewhere between doing nothing and actually fixing things, yeah. you know. Well, you know, you know, sometimes you fix things and it breaks something else, you know. That, that's true. Sometimes that's true. it's just like, uh, uh, it's like Jenga. You got it, you got it to <laughs> it's a certain like point. Jenga? It's like Jenga. You don't, okay. that's it. I'm not going to push any more little things out. That's good. Don't touch it. It's perfect the way it is. It's perfect the way it is. Jenga needs the ability to do a system image. <laughs> yeah. So you could roll back you could to image that time. The Jenga. That's a good yeah. idea. Oh, it all fell down. Let's start out. Let's just image. <laughs> so Actually, you, Jenga is like a personal computer. I never really drew that comparison, uh -huh. but I, I see what you're saying. You see what I'm saying? You know where I'm going with this? Mm -hmm. This, by, by the way, just to, to clarify, this is a Windows 7 flaw. Yes. Not a, not a Vista. This didn't happen at Vista. I don't believe so. Wow. Well, Huh. Windows 8, I wonder, maybe. I wonder. wonder. You've been writing a lot about Windows 8. You keep getting, you've got a good source. I don't know who this is, but you you know all about this thing. <laughs> yeah, so uh, as I've told people, you know, anyone can download a build. I mean, you know, builds leak and whatnot. But I think the benefit that I have is that I'm working with Raphael, who can actually he knows what's break into these things knows, in a very meaningful he, way. He knows what he's looking at. He's dangerous. He needs to be arrested. I, I um, <laughs> you know, he, he is he, right on the edge of being a hacker. Yeah, it's good. I like it. Oh, every everybody should have a hacker in their life. But I figured, you know, uh, we, I sort of discussed this very vaguely last week. I was kind of confused that nobody called me on it. You know, like, w what were you talking about exactly? But um, what I was basically saying was that we, we saw that builds were starting to leak 
out into the public. And of course, when you get these things out into the nubosphere, or whatever the blogosphere, or whatever you want to call it, the you know, people, the nubosphere. The nubosphere. <laughs> you know, people are going to just post screenshots of you know these leaked builds, and it's like, right. yeah, whatever. I mean, like anyone can do that, right? But you know, we were sitting on some information that I thought was pretty unique and valuable and interesting, uh, which we were because you know we're working on a book, and we it's early access to this information is really important. And you have legit access. No, no, we don't. Oh, we Microsoft's do, we have, not giving you any uh, insight. Not yet, not yet. That's, Actually, that in a happen. way, it's good they're not, because you couldn't talk about this if they were. Yeah, but you still walk a fine line, because, uh, and this is something we talked about, uh, Raphael and I, which was simply that, you know, for now, obviously, we're relying on whatever sources we have. In the future, of course, we want, you know, we want the legitimate access with Microsoft. They'll have a reviewer's workshop and a, an official beta and all that stuff, and obviously, we want to be part of that. But... You know, the reality is it's kind of a tough line to walk. You don't want to destroy your relationship with Microsoft. Um, you have a, I don't want to call it a responsibility, but, a, a, you know, a, a need of some kind because either because we're bloggers or journalists or book writers or whatever it is uh, to write about this information when we do find out about it. And then there's also the, the, the point about, okay, we're writing a book. So if, if Microsoft kicks us out of a reviewer's workshop, I mean, can't we still get the book done? And the answer is yes, because that public information will still be public and we'll still be able to get it. But if Microsoft were to come to us and say, look, seriously, you got to stop, you know, what, what would our response be? And we decided very early on our response will be, of course, we'll stop, you know. Um, so we kind of went into this knowing that we were going to get in trouble, but knowing that we wanted to do it because I, well, because people will see that some bizarre little blog has published a picture of something and then they'll write me and they'll say, Paul, you're supposed to be the Windows guy. How come you're not talking about Windows 8, you know? So... I don't want to rely on what other people are doing. I want to be able to publish something that's unique and interesting. And we had it, so we did. You know, I th the thing this is, is actually great because you're very transparent. All journalists have these yeah. conundrums, yeah. right? Um, and I'll tell you, I'll take it completely out of the PC sphere. If you okay. cover Washington D.C., yeah, the, you're inside the Beltway. You need sources, right? But at the same time, you're doing a deal with the devil because it's a very tricky thing. You and and, oh, yeah, and yeah. the key is, of course, to remember who you work for, and what happens, unfortunately, with a lot of journalists, certainly uh, inside the Beltway, and I think sometimes in the trade presses, is they oh, become yeah. co-opted by the companies that they're writing about, <laughs> and suddenly they forget uh, they're, I, they're, they're they're working for us as users, right. not for the companies. And I, I see this I, in I, tech I, press all the time, all the time, or the in time. car, any trade yep. press. Cars, motorboats, whatever. It's, it's Look, very uh, easy. My, Microsoft as a corporation with shareholders and, and uh, partnerships, financial arrangements, and uh, billions of dollars at stake has a responsibility uh, of sorts, uh, of its own. You know, uh, that, it's not related to me personally, but they have their own thing. It's of course completely they do. understandable. We and all I have, have own our thing. own responsibilities, but they don't, but we're, as a journalist, yeah. your responsibility is not to the company, is to. Yeah, they don't see it that way sometimes, no. by the way. Well, but... why do you think Apple throws me through me out of their events? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all, and it's people say, well, battle. why would yeah. you do that, Leo? Because my responsibility is not to Apple. You wouldn't, sure. you wouldn't want to listen to me if I towed the company line. We wouldn't want to listen to you if you yeah. said whatever Microsoft says. Well, it's a tough line to walk. I mean, you have to. But you need your sources. I would like, I liked, I like that I have an official relationship with Microsoft. I'd like to keep it uh, as positive as possible, as, of course, and constructive. And, uh, you know, it's, it's good for me to be able to meet with them on an official basis and all that kind of stuff. On the other hand, um, if I have stuff that uh, comes to me from outside of those channels, it's kind of a tough thing. So you have to walk this line. But, you know, the, the truth is um, we started publishing information about Windows 8 about a week ago. You know, the weekend went by and then Monday and Tuesday and, you know, they were silent and we, it's actually kind of a, a nervous thing. You know, it's like, so how come we haven't heard from Microsoft, <laughs> you know? So I think we're going to, I think what we're going to do for now, I think we made our point, you know, which is that anyone, like I said, you could hear, look, here's a picture of the Windows 8 desktop as it now stands, you know, that's cute. Um, but look over here, we have this other stuff that you can't find in that build, um, so I think we've made our point. I think we're. I think we'll probably wrap it up pretty soon, and uh, you know, and, and see what happens. Well, and tell us we, now. Give us some juice now that you've told us all this. <laughs> what do you, right, what do you well, know? I, what do you know, Paul? Well, yeah, I mean, I saw, for example, I mean, but, I think it's it's widely agreed that you and Raphael are the source, the yeah, most reliable, yeah. credible source for what's going on in there. I, 
I think we're almost the only source, really. I mean, yeah. like, because like I said, I mean, there's, uh, there's these other, anyone, like I said, anyone can download a build and say, oh, look, smart screens in there. Yeah, it is. Yeah, but, you, good. you know, there's other stuff. So, I mean, uh, you know, we know that Windows 8 is going to have different user interfaces and will be applicable to different device types, you know. So there's an immersive UI that's going to work like Windows Phone and will be aimed probably at tablets and phone type devices and so forth. And there'll be special applications based on the Windows Phone application type called AppX packages um, that are, you know, uh, packaged, if you will, you know, as XML and zip and so forth, and uh, will look like phone apps do today, uh, basically. And so we have some examples of that stuff. Um, there's a PDF reader that we uh, that Raphael found in there. Um, yeah, that I thought was interesting that Microsoft will start bundling PDF capabilities into uh, Windows. Yeah, 8. and then, you know, and, and some expected things around uh, niceties with the user interface and um, you know, colorization and all the glass stuff. You know, if you look at some of the glass work that Microsoft did in Windows Vista and 7, you know, one of the things I would have said and did say, I'm sure, on this podcast for early, very early on is Microsoft is relatively new to this transparency thing. So if, you, if you're familiar with how Mac OS X evolved over the years, you know that in the beginning it was like super transparent so that you would pull down a menu and you could actually see what was behind the menu bleeding through the menu and it made it hard to read the menu. And that's the type of thing you... You do in the first version because you're so excited you figure out transparency, you just want to put it everywhere. But then you realize over time this really kind of hinders the user interface. And so Apple kind of backed off from that. So you see the same evolution in Windows where, um, you know, they add glass and all those transparency effects, but then they leave some stuff out. So one of the, and it sounds like little things, but they're actually kind of cool little things. You know, like um, you can make, you have themes in Windows 7, so you can color the glass, which you couldn't do in Vista. You can select a background wallpaper, uh, a bitmap image or photo or whatever it is, or color, um, like you would before. And then you could color the glass to match it. You know, and of course, a lot of people said, well, why, why isn't there an option so that the glass auto colors to whatever the background is? So as the background image changes, because that's one of the things you can do dynamically, the glass would just change with it. Like, so, like in Windows 7? No, it doesn't. It doesn't do it automatically. You have to do it manually. Oh. So now, so now in Windows 8, it does do it automatically. Oh, cool. I thought that, it did do that. Oh, well, that's nice. The, back, the background can change, but the not the color. background changes, but not the shade. I got it. I got right. it. I got it. Yeah, so yeah. it's one of those, it's like a fit and finish thing when you think yeah, about it. It's you know, just that, a slight detail, that, but that can make a big difference. Yeah. So, um, you know, and again, I, the point of this stuff was simply that um, this is not something anyone could just find. You know, uh, we wanted to make sure that the stuff we put out was unique, you know, uh, whether it's, you know, like the immersive version of Internet Explorer, which is this. Uh, IE version. It looks like the one on the phone, but actually has the rendering engine from IE9 in the back end, you know, aimed at tablets and touch compatible and all that stuff. So um, just some stuff we did, you know, it's just a several article, very short articles. And we really just wanted to show a couple screenshots of each feature and say, hey, this is what we, this is what we know. This is what we sort of think based on what we see in there. Um, yeah, it just... WinSupersite.com <laughs> if you want to find yeah. out what Paul knows. The, the weird thing about this was that, and this is completely coincidental. Well, actually not completely coincidental, but last weekend um, my company did a CMS upgrade and my site is still reeling from this problem. <laughs> so we were actually down for many hours on Sunday. And then, you know, I finally came back. I still, as I, I just looked at it, it's still, <laughs> they're still working on it. Hopefully by the end of the week it'll be fixed, but um, Cue the you know, Squarespace ad. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah well, <laughs> uh, we're not gonna we're not gonna convince Penton of that, no, unfortunately. It's but, all right. It's all right. But, you know, you get all these emails from people like, "Oh, did Microsoft shut you down?" You know, um, no, 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 they didn't. But then, you know, Raphael uh, <laughs> has whatever hosting service he has, and the traffic to his site that just shut him down from him. traffic. They shut yeah. they shut him down for bandwidth. Right. And then, of course, people are like, "Oh, Microsoft must have shut you guys down." You know. No, it was just a bad kind of perfect storm week, and that's just the way it worked There are out. two sides of the equation, too. Remember that Microsoft wants coverage. I mean, I'm, this is not for you. You know this, Paul. I'm telling, I'm telling the listeners. Yeah. So Microsoft also treads carefully. Uh, you know, it's a, it's sure. a little ballet. It's a little dance. The journalists push. We try to get objective mm -hmm. stories. And uh, some there are companies, Apple leaps to mind, who really don't care because they get so much positive press that they don't need to... In any way, you know, if Macworld pissed them off, fine, see ya. Yeah, they, they're not going right. to uh, appease anybody. Right, but most companies, uh, you know, Steve Ballmer very famously had that, well, anyway, Dvorak always said, had that enemies list on his blackboard in his, <laughs> in his, on the whiteboard in his office. Uh, and so companies are aware of who they like and don't like, but they can't just go out and say, you're cut off. 
especially in in our business because there you know there's not an infinite supply of respectable press covering you mm. so uh, and I, I think within Microsoft at least I can't speak for other companies but I know there are these engineers toiling away you know think about right you have respect for them well and I was gonna say and I think they <laughs> secretly or not you know in some ways like to see have, that their work is getting recognition you, you know exactly. Windows comes out every three years you know so you, you, they, you, you're in some little cubicle no, I don't have cubicles they have offices you're in some office and You've been working and working and working, and it's going to be a long time, you know, before this thing gets out. And the truth is, you know, people are very excited about this information. There's no, there's no weird bad news here, right? It's not like anyone's going to see one of these things and be like, oh, Windows 8 is a piece of crap. You know, they're really screwing this thing up. I mean, people are excited by it. You know, it's nice. It's good press, really. Yeah. It yeah. really is. And that's the thing. I mean, our, our heart is in the right place. It's not about... Uh, defaming Microsoft or the product. I mean, we were excited about it. I mean, well, we're, at, at, at heart, we're enthusiasts and, you know, we're glad to see is, something cool happen. The risk is you might see something, it's in a, you know, a, a non-public release early, early, early stage and you might see something and say, well, this is crap. And Microsoft might say, well, what, you know, this is not the, but that's the thing. I think you're fairly yeah. responsible. I think you and Raphael are responsible, respectful. And uh, so you don't say things like, oh my God, they're going to build PDFs in. This is the worst thing that ever happened. Because <laughs> no, I mean, there's no point in having a huge opinion about it. We just sort of present it as it is. And, you know, I think the, the problem from Microsoft's perspective is that, you know, they don't want to show off a feature now that may not make it in. You know, what if they pull the PDF reader, for example? Right. Now people are like, oh, you know, they, yes, exactly. they're already hemorrhaging features, you know, and it's like, we right. never promised that. It's the <laughs> you long one problem where they said yeah. we're going to do WinFS. Wasn't right. any WinFS. Yep. And then everybody blamed uh, Microsoft. Well, they, so, so you, yeah. So you're going <laughs> to, I mean, actually, that's, that's a true story. But anyway. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's not like that. That is, in fact, exactly <laughs> like <laughs> That's it's like matter. the Stephen Wright joke. Like I have a new song, and it goes. It doesn't go something like this. It goes exactly like this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you're going to scale back a little bit as we get closer to action. I think we've uh, kind of made the point. You know, uh, I just, um, yeah, like I said, I don't want the Nubosphere to get too uh, <laughs> too much press right now over something that's nothing. Like I mean, my point was simply. Anyone can download a leak build, you know, the uh, uh, through via Raphael. This is nothing to do with me, really. I mean, this guy just has the technical ability to break into these things in ways that are pretty exciting. We should say his stuff. last name. I can't because I'll say it wrong. And I I always want to call him Raphael Riviera. I keep telling him that's a way better name than his real name. Is it? It's not Rivera. Rivera. It's Rivera. It's Rivera. And, uh, and it's within windows.com. Within windows.com. Yep. If you want to read more, but of course, SuperSite for Windows has it all too. WinSuperSite.com. Good. I mean, give him. Yeah, a plug. we co-posted. So give the, the kid upstairs. a plug. <laughs> He's not really a kid, but yes, yes. Let me. Uh, we'll have him on here. You should. We should. We have should him get on. him back on. I love Raphael. He was. He's yeah. a little quiet. Well, that's because uh, we're, we're like blabbermouths. Yeah, that's you know? probably it. Windows Home Server. RTM on MSDN. <laughs> LOL. I can already sense your complete disinterest in this. <laughs> no, I love it. No, y y yeah, no, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just go get lunch. You talk. No, it's it's <laughs> all right. So Windows Home Server 2011 Veil, uh, Windows Small Business Server Essentials 2011, aka Aurora, and also Windows Storage Server 2011 Essentials Breckenridge were all completed. They were completed, I think, about a week ago. But they're available on MSDN and TechNet. So I've installed Aurora, which is the small business server version. Now I've got home server is kind of the basis for all of my data. I believe I can do a, I believe I can, I'll be able to wipe out my system partition, if you will, and just install the new version and then point the server at all the data that's already on there. I'm not going to do that right now. I've got uh, two back-to-back -back trips to Vegas coming up uh, next week and the week after. And I don't want to do this. You know, this week has been so hectic with the site makeover stuff. I don't want to, you know, just add to the problem. So I'm running the, you know, that final pre-release version, a release candidate version that will work through, I think, August. So after I get back from those two trips, I'll do this little uh, switcheroo and we'll see how it works. But first, I'm going to back everything up. So um, anyway, if you're on MSDN or TechNet, this is a great opportunity 
to grab those things because they are finalized. That's all I that's all I have left. That's all I have to say. Good. We're moving on now. I don't know okay. what you said. Wow. Mobile. You hold your you actually had to <laughs> I had like, a little nah, conversation. Nah, 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 nah. I went to the bathroom. I took a shower. I, I washed see. my hair. Uh, checked in with Anubisphere. <laughs> and now I'm back. So you like that term, don't you? <laughs> I do. I might name the show after it. How do you spell <laughs> Nubisphere? I I didn't write it down. I don't know. N e w b i s p n o o b. Noob. Oh, noob is n o o b. Okay. Yeah. And then is sphere, I guess. Is sphere. Nubisphere. Man, I got a nice manicure, though. I gotta say. <laughs> wow. Wow. Moving right along. Yes, we sir. talked actually uh, last week, and I, I thought this was an interesting conversation about. How yeah. the mobile world has really changed. It used to be the company would choose a phone for you. They'd tell you, you're using this phone with these capabilities. We'll build it for you. Boom. Now, everybody wants, and I think this happened with the iPhone, but now, of course, the uh, Yeah, it, it definitely was open. the iPhone. It was the iPhone that did it. And it started, I remember this happening at the time. It was CEOs of companies, especially, or executives, who went to their ID department and said, I'm getting an iPhone, figure it out. And, of course, to these exactly. IT <laughs> You know, the IT people and admins, they were like, you got to be kidding me. And of course, the first iPhone didn't have any enterprise, anything at all. And they were f really freaking out over this. Um, you know, to that day, the big enterprise phone, of course, was the BlackBerry. And it's still huge today, although it's declining. BlackBerry did kind of an end round around Exchange by adding their own server, right? They have this BlackBerry enterprise server thing. Um and by virtue of this, and they were always very security oriented. They they just became the de facto phone, you know, for businesses. And Blackberries are still deployed very heavily in the government building education, so uh, government um, corporation, you know, business, general business education, and so forth. Still a big deal. But now that Microsoft has added these policies to Exchange directly, you can actually not deploy. That's a separate product, but you can manage smartphones through Exchange using Exchange Active, uh, Ex Active Sync policies. So I, 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 last week I asked for people on the podcast to you know, write in about what they're doing for the, around that kind of stuff at work. And I already also um, uh, asked for this via um, one of the newsletters. And I got hundreds of responses. It's interesting. very interesting. From the, All from the IT of life, folks you know. or from the, yeah, from the yeah, users? Yeah. Or, or even people just in businesses. This is what we're doing, you know. And, I'll, and I, I, maybe I should have specified this up front because a lot of them asked me not to name names or name the companies they work for. And, of course, I would never do that. But it was very interesting. And so I've written a little bit about it. I'll write a little bit more about it. But I, I think what it kind of boils down to, essentially, is that, yes, I mean, it was the iPhone that really kicked this thing off. And if you just adhere to a very basic set of policies um, via a device, I mean, if a device does, um, you know, pretty much all bets are off. There, there are... Aside from these basic policies, which include such things as, you know, uh, for, you know requiring a password, uh, the ability to remotely really, uh, wipe the device. Yeah. Um, you, you know, exchange, yeah. just basic exchange support. So you could do, uh, you know, contacts, calendar, email, and if it's supported, also tasks. Um, yeah, encryption sometimes uh, is required. That actually keeps Windows Phone out of the equation, interestingly. And... Um, and then you kind of go from there. You know, some places have more security, some have less, I guess. You know, and it, a, a lot of times, just to speak very generally, very large businesses, government, require more security. Uh, smaller businesses and, uh, you know, uh, medium-sized businesses, depending on what their, you know, what business they're in and so forth and what their IT policies are like, will, will maybe require less. Um, but that's the basics of it, you know. I, I've also, on the side, I haven't really written about this yet, but I've been working with Office 365. And one of the things that's in there is the ability to manage devices through Exchange Active Sync. So I've been looking in at Office? that in Office 365, which is the coming version of uh, what they call Business Productivity Online Suite. It's the hosted version of Exchange and SharePoint and Link. And so uh, as, as an individual or as a very small company, you could sign up at the Microsoft website and have access to Exchange without hosting it yourself, you know, w without having the IT staff and all that kind of stuff. So, um, and that's free? No, it's not free, oh, okay. but it's as cheap as six dollars a month, you know, per that, user. That's awesome. I mean, host who nobody wants to host their own exchange server, but a host exchange server is great. Right, right. Because all of a sudden, you go from the situation where you have zero infrastructure to you could actually impose like Exchange Active Sync policies on phones. Policies, yeah, yeah, and th this is it's very interesting. So I've been what I you know, and I have all the representative devices here. I can actually test this. 
So I can go in and do things like, well, I'm going to require encryption and see how that affects things, you know, when you actually set up the device. You know, the, the missing piece here is device deployment, right? Microsoft has servers for that, but they're not, they're, they're sort of rare in the sense they're not selling very well yet. Um, and of course, I think in future versions of that Windows um, Intune service, they'll support that through the cloud as well. And I think that's where it gets really interesting. But just the ability to impose policies on mobile devices, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing, right? I mean, you know, and, and again, for $6 a month, uh, you could go in and actually impose that on your phone. And, and it's saying it, it's a buck seventy-five a month per user. Oh, is it? Okay, it could be. So I it's could. really cheap. Yeah, it can be, yeah. So it's, um, you know, I mean, it's, it's very we, it's Google Apps, we pay 50 bucks a year per seat. Yeah, I think the cheapest version of mm, Office 365 is uh, plus or minus a few dollars from what you just said. I, I think that's how it actually works Amazing. out. Amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's... It's just an interesting change. And I, the one thing I intend to do in the near future, and I, I hope to do this for Monday, but if not for the following Monday, is I want to compare the, the leading smartphone platforms and say, where do they line up with all of these features? And I think they're going to be roughly comparable. That's my rough kind of gut, gut estimate based on what I've seen so far. Um, there is an interesting thing going on with BlackBerry as well, but they've actually, they're moving to a hosted version of the BlackBerry Enterprise Service server, I guess where BlackBerry is going to host it themselves. So there will even be a deal in Office 365 where people will be able to uh, connect their Blackberries through bl this BlackBerry Enterprise service, I guess. I'm not sure what they're going to call it, um, which brings up the kind of uh, almost comedic thought of BlackBerry having to now service their own server because that server is notably hard to, <laughs> to manage, you know, and uh, is known to be buggy and so forth. But we'll see how that goes. It's interesting. So I, I, I wanted just to thank everybody for writing in. And, I, you know, like I said, I, I will, I'll have more to say about this in the future. But it's, it's, been, it's been very enlightening to see how, you know, where that is. I'm sorry. <laughs> did, you, <laughs> did you call? Would you, would you like me to speak now? I, you know, you're welcome to. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I think, I think of it as a back and forth. Yeah, sometimes I do. Yeah. I, my manicure, uh, the nails weren't completely dried. I just had to go back and get a little touch up. Okay. <laughs> Whoa. As well so, so uh, somebody must have listened to your tirade on Windows Phone updates. Yeah. Because <laughs> they said, I'll do it. Now they're in a little bit of trouble. Yeah, I think they are. That's my understanding. So... I thought this was going to be the biggest story of the week, that this was going to be the greatest thing ever. This guy, uh, Chris Walsh, uh, from Australia. Kind of, this is, I, I like it. This is a hero to me. Yeah, this me too. This is the he Paul knows, Revere yeah, yeah, yeah. of Windows Phone updates. Basically what he did was he, he took the publicly available Windows Phone support tool, figured out the various methods it was using and so forth, and found out that it, contain the key for bypassing the block that was preventing people from getting these Windows Phone updates. <laughs> now, you know that that Windows Phone updating thing has been kind of the big story this year, for me at least, that Microsoft completed that first update back in December and hasn't been able to deliver it to most users so far. And of course, there's been all kinds of snafus around that and, uh, you know, big drama and so forth. But, you know, the fact remains, if you are, as I am, an AT&T customer, i.e. a customer of the premier Windows Phone partner that Microsoft has, and you bought the most popular phone, like I did, the Windows, uh, the Samsung Focus. Like the best I did phone. too, yeah. Yep. That you are on the, sh the, the, the longest tail ever <laughs> for getting this stuff. That as you of almost today... almost said something else. <laughs> well, that, yeah, you know, right. the February update, as they're now calling it, may ship, if you're lucky, oh. in the second half of April. That's as fast as these guys are going. It's really slow. Yeah. Um, so, it's frustrating, to put it simply. And what, what this guy has done, basically, is found a way around the blocks. I think that'd be the easiest way of saying it. So, he released a tool. Uh, and, I, and I used it, not on my main phone, because I'd used a different method to get the update. Uh, but I used it on my other, my other Windows phone, also on AT&T, just to see if it would work. And it worked really well. I mean, it works so well that it, it, it kind of speaks volumes about the stupidity 
of the reality of the update situation. You know, that this could be so easy. Why do they make it so damn hard? It's so stupid, you know? See, it seemed to work fantastic. A lot of people wrote this up. I mean, think, you know, I think there's been a, a big need in this market for an answer to us, what is really a kind of a stupid problem. So it seemed like we had our hero among us moment there, but not, I, he's not going to jail or anything, is he? No, but okay. basically, uh, and this is based on my understanding of what's going on. Microsoft, I think, asked him to pull the tool, which yeah. he did. Yeah. And he still hasn't written an explanation, but I've, I, I've seen published, at least in one place, what I've heard, which is basically that, according to Microsoft, and actually I should say, Microsoft has since blogged about this, so maybe we should just see what Microsoft said about it, which was basically boils down to, uh, it's possible. And, and, and it's this thing, it's funny, they, <laughs> they really use a lot of caveats, right? Um, it's not, it doesn't say, for example, using this update will ruin your phone. You know, they don't, they don't write it like that. What they say is, if you attempt to use one of these workarounds, and by the way, there's only one workaround. I don't know what that's all about. <laughs> one, of, one of the one workarounds. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we can't say for sure what might happen to your phone. Well, no. Yeah. We can't. Um, it, could, no. it could go completely smoothly. It could, it did for basically everyone who's used it. Um, you might be getting the, you might not be getting the important device specific software we would typically deliver in the official update. Now that's, that's right. actually true. Okay. So to understand what that means, you need to understand that there, there's an update, you know, the thing that Microsoft creates, but then attached to that update delivered on a per device basis are the associated updates that come from both the hardware maker, you know, the company that made the phone and then also the wireless carrier you know, the company that sells it and supports it. These things are bundled with Microsoft's update if they're available, if they're there, so that when you get the update, what you get are all three of those things potentially. So, for example, in the case of the uh, Samsung Focus, which is sold from AT&T, whenever that thing is released, May, June, whatever it is, you know, AT&T is slow, uh, it will include the no-do update that Microsoft created, but also possibly, you know, some driver updates, maybe some a firmware update, whatever it is. So the, the version of Nodo, which is that first update, uh, the first real update that a Windows phone user would get as a Samsung Focus user may differ slightly. It's not the stock update. It's the stock update plus some other stuff. So what they're saying is you may, you, you may not be getting that stuff, which is actually, it's true. You won't be getting that stuff. It says, or your phone might get misconfigured and not receive future updates. Now, that that I part, could see is, is reasonable. Then I would yeah, it's, it's believable, except for one thing. I've already heard from multiple users who own Samsung Focuses in Canada, where the, uh, I think it's Rogers who sells it, has already, in fact, released the update. Oh. And here's the thing. If you use this tool to update to Nodo, and then you plug it into the PC and sync through the Zoom PC software, you get an update for, from Samsung. So it notices that you have Nodo, but not the Samsung Nodo the stuff. Right Nodo. So it actually gives you that stuff. Oh, so I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying in in this one case, at least, what they're saying is not necessarily. The, well, they said it could happen. They did say it could. Yeah, they're very careful of the way they word this. And then it says, the, the I think, the ugly part. It's even possible your phone might stop working properly. We don't now, know. It could happen. You never know. So I, I think the reality here is that worst case scenario, uh, if for some reason, say there's some future update that comes out, well, I mean, we know there's an SSL update coming soon or whether we're talking about Mango, you know, the next major update, whatever it is, some future update. And for some reason, because you updated your phone this way, it doesn't work. The, what Microsoft is saying, I think, is that the worst case scenario is that you'll have to have the phone reflashed, the ROM reflashed, the original Can you, retail And you ROM. can't do that yourself. You can't do that yourself. And as of today, you can't do it in a store for oh. the most part because they don't have the ROM sitting there, you know, for reflashing. Right. Although that's curious to me that they don't. For many phones, I guess, and I'm, I'm going to look this up, uh, apparently the ROMs have leaked in various ways. Right. So uh, not for the Samsung Focus, as it turns out, but for many of the phones, the ROMs are out there. So that might be an interesting thing to kind of collect and have a table or something, you know, where you could point people to that stuff. So let's say as a Samsung Focus user, use this utility, work great, you update, uh, and then some future update comes out, and now you can't get it. So you go to AT&T, and they'll be like, well... Yeah, we can't do anything about this here. I see, you know, and they'd have to ship it back somewhere. So you might be without your phone for some amount of time. I, I, I sort of assume that's the worst case scenario. And this ties back to this thing we were talking about earlier where with smartphones, you know, you pay a lot of money to own this thing. You're not completely unsupported, right? Um, you're paying $100 a month 
typically, I would say on average in the U.S. for a smartphone. Um, that $100 a month buys you support too. So I realize it's possible that AT&T might, I don't know, investigate your phone and no. say, look, oh, you no. did some work around. I'm, I'm saying possible. Possible. It's more, it's more likely that they get the phone in, they try to do what you try to do, it doesn't work, and then they just send you a new phone right. or a refurbished phone or whatever it is. I, there's no way that a company the size of AT&T, which, by the way, says, mil sells millions and millions they of They don't care about the phone. They want your $100 a month. They couldn't care less about this punk of plastic and metal. And, and I think this is kind of a scare tactic on Microsoft's part, which I don't really appreciate, but whatever. So uh, I'm sure they've, uh, you know, cornered this poor guy and made him feel like a jerk. But I think the reality is he's done a wonderful public service. He should be applauded for it. And if you did apply this update like I did, I wouldn't worry about it. Who cares? I mean, you know, the worst personally, case, no mango for you. Yeah. Worst and, case. you know, I, I look, uh, my reality, and this doesn't apply to everybody, but I, I, I fully expect by the time some future update comes out, based on the molasses slow progress they've made so far, that I'll be on a different device anyway. So, right. whatever. You're, I mean, I, you're not like you and me. Actually, you're, you're exactly <laughs> like you and me. I'm exactly like you and me, but I'm, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know either. Let's take a break. Fresh books, and then we'll okay. get back to more of Paul Therott. Uh Stock market news. Interesting. Antitrust news, even more interesting. <laughs> okay. And our tip of the week still to come, our app of the week, and a, and a book of the week, too. But first, if you are in, uh, as, as many of us are, if you're in the uh, independent contractor business, if you do your own invoices, I fortunately, I do not. I have... I have built myself a walled garden and uh, with many gardeners at great expense. And so I no longer do invoices. But I remember when I was like you, a little person. No, I'm, go I'm going all wrong with this, I think. This probably isn't going to really sell any products, is it, Paul? <laughs> at this point... I, I, I felt that you were heading somewhere. Yeah. Down, down, down. Let me rephrase that. Okay. I remember when I was like you, a little person, and I had... <laughs> no, wow. I'm, just, I'm just kidding. I very well remember this and very well could be doing this again any day now. And I can tell you, if I were sending out my own invoices today, I'd do what I did just a few years ago when I had to invoice all those little people that I would... Actually, you know, we may still do... We do quite a bit of invoicing. I just, you know, I have, I have people who do that. But uh, let me tell you, this is a pain. Nobody likes to invoice, and that's why FreshBooks is so... Fantastic. Made by little people for little people. <laughs> Sorry. You think, you think still the wrong strategy, Paul? I'm, I'm kind of I don't know. It. It's not the way I would have went with it. <laughs> <laughs> you look, nobody <laughs> likes to send invoices. It's just a pain in the keister. And uh, and I have to admit, when you know, I I uh, I would sometimes just not invoice people. I don't know how much money I left on the table. I remember one time I mentioned this before, I sent an invoice nine months after I did the work. And they said, what are you, what? <laughs> what? If you invoice us immediately, we'll pay you. But now? This is such a good way to do it. And once I started using FreshBooks, and I started using this uh, a few years ago, it just changed my life. Invoices got paid more quickly because people were, you know, there's even a button right on the invoice that says pay Leo right now. I wish it still said pay Leo right now. Unfortunately, now it says your name, whoever you are. Uh, they can do it with a credit card. They can do it with uh, any one of 11 different online payment services. They can even, and I, I, you know, clients, believe it or not, want to pay you. It's just as much of a pain for them to go through the invoices and pay and write the checks as it was for you to make the invoices. So FreshBooks makes it easy on both sides, easy to make the invoices, easy for them to pay. In fact, they'll even do automated invoicing and collections. Recurring invoices, your client can set up to automatically pay that's the last time you have to think about it. It's just great. Any currency, too. This was great because I was working in Canada and billing from the U.S. I had some, some invoices were in Canadian dollars, some American dollars. Handled it transparently and beautifully. Of course, there are still some old-fashioned clients who like paper invoices. They don't want the email invoices. That's not a problem. For a nominal fee, FreshBooks will print, stamp, and mail your invoice in professional-looking... Uh, uh, envelopes that just, it really you, makes people think, boy, this is a big shot. These look better than the invoices I do right now. 
Uh, and of course, your data is backed up in real time to three sources, two different locations, and then on to tape at offsite locations nightly. All facilities SAS 70 compliant. All data, 256-bit SSL encryption. You, you know, you got to love this. These guys are doing it right. That's why 2 million people have started have been using FreshBooks since 2004 when they started. And I want you to try it for free, up to three clients for free. You will look more professional. You will get paid faster. You will love it. Just trust me. Go to FreshBooks.com right now and sign up. You will love this. FreshBooks. All right. Paul, uh, let's see. Let's talk about the stock market. Okay. This doesn't seem possible. A Microsoft to make huge gains on Apple on, on NASDAQ? Yeah, sort of. Oh. So <laughs> <laughs> um, this, is a, this is a tough issue for me because I'm not a, you know, a I financial don't we don't do wizard this. of any kind. No, or, you we know, stay but away from this. We've, we've I think learned. we understand that the NASDAQ manages uh, different indices. It's like the over-the-counter market as opposed to the stock yeah, market, the, the, the you know, Wall yeah. Street, yeah. Um, so one of them is called the NASDAQ 100, and this is a, uh, I think it consists of um, an index. 100 like of the, the largest Jones, companies. Yeah, it's like the Dow Jones 60. It's a it's an index of 100 companies, so you yep. know how the NASDAQ is doing. The 100 biggest index. companies based on right. market cap. Right. You know, and we know market cap-wise, uh, Apple surpassed Microsoft last year to become the biggest technology company. And the way they did it was their stock price went through the roof. It's crazy. Apple stock price is in the 340 range or whatever, I think. And yep. Apple's uh, Microsoft rather is in the $25 range. Right. So how could this be? Which has been since I was nine years old or something. Right. So <laughs> a little bit of a problem. So uh, I guess, you know, again, I don't understand this. I, I'm just, I'm sort of reporting it, but I don't. I don't actually understand how this works per se, but NASDAQ has an internal rule about these indices where if any one company becomes uh, too big... Too big a percentage the of the overall one. ...of the index, right. Yes. They have to rebalance it. Well, you know why they and, do that. Well, because if Apple well, were to tumble, the, the, the index would tumble because Apple right. would have so much weight. So they're trying to make it so that, you know, there's it's not... Yeah. Well, and to give you an idea of how crazy Apple's stock price is, there are 100 companies in this index... And Apple's, just Apple's, is responsible for over 20% or one-fifth right. of the entire index. Right. The other 99 companies make up the remainder. You so know, They're afraid of the NASDAQ 100 becoming the Apple 1. Well, yeah, exactly. So as of, I think it's May 1st or May 2nd, they're going to rebalance it. And, you know, the interesting impact of the rebalancing is that some other, it's actually not as many as I would have thought, but some small handful of companies actually now achieve um, better weight, if you will, or more weight within this index, uh, whereas most others actually go down, as it turns out, including Apple. So um, some of the beneficiaries were some high-tech companies, and none of them is going to benefit more than Microsoft. Uh, Microsoft's, um, I'd have to look this up, let's see if I can find it, but Microsoft's weighting within this index is going to uh, go up the most, actually, of all the companies, and of course, of all the tech companies. I think it was uh, Cisco, Google, Intel, and one other company. Uh, we're going to see some small gains as well. But Microsoft's weighting is going to jump from 3.4% to uh, over 8% of the uh, of this uh, index. So this is only relevant for people who invest in index funds, which I, I actually do because I don't want to know what stocks mm -hmm. I'm right. buying in case tech stocks are in there. It's, you know, it's well, plus it's a, it's a way to diversify in some ways, right. I guess. Or, uh, and it's not unusual for stock indexes to be reported. Um, uh, you know, they, when they say the Dow is down, what they're really saying is the Dow Jones Industrial Index is down, which is just an index of the Dow. They're not talking about the whole Dow. Right, now, right. I Something think, they feel is representative right. of the... And that's, uh, in, that, in theory, was what the NASDAQ 100 would be. But I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, financial wizards in our chat room, but... With mm -hmm. Na Dow, the Dow, they report on the DJ DJIA, which is the industrial index. The Nasdaq, it's usually a composite of the whole market, not the 100. So right, the, no, the Nasdaq 100 is something very specific. Yeah, they it's don't, not, they don't report on that. Not, so when you see the Nasdaq, Nasdaq, Nasdaq stock is down, market, is it? yeah. right, it's not the entire Nasdaq. Uh, right, and and when you see the Nasdaq is down, I think it almost always is. Uh, the th several thousand stocks, not the 100 we're talking about. It literally is. Yeah, NASDAQ 100 is literally the 100 biggest right. non-financial right. companies, I think. It's so this right. may not even be that important. Is Although, it QQQ, uh, is Rick Five? Because I have, actually, that's, that is that is an index fund I buy. So it's QQQ. Okay. So okay. that is the 100. I, that is an index fund I buy. 
or QQQ. Apparently, though, I, I guess this will have some impact on Apple's stock price. You know, this is seen as kind it of a, a negative sign for Apple. Yeah, I mean, it was already a little sell-off. Um, we'll see what happens. It, it could, you know, May could come and go and nothing will happen. You know, we don't know. But I, I saw, one, look, I don't know anything about the financial markets per se, like I said. Mm -hmm. But I saw, you know, I still see things that make even me look like a financial genius by comparison, which was someone had written a story where they said, you know, um, NASDAQ dropping Apple. Do, do, do they know something about Steve Jobs? You know, and it's like, oh, no. geez, you got to be kidding they me. They want like, that says, index to more accurately reflect the right, overall right. performance of the market. It has nothing to do with that. Yeah. yeah. And it, but, but it does if you invest in index funds. And as a matter of fact, QQQ is one of the index funds I hold. And uh, so that would impact that. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay. There you go. Exchange. <laughs> it's an exchange traded oh, fund. That's how you can buy a NASDAQ index fund on the exchange. I think that's exactly right. Yeah, that's what. And I like to buy index funds because there's less man, there are fewer man, lower management fees or none because they're not doing any work as is appropriate. I'm sorry we got into that one. <laughs> Uh -huh. no, it's a, Google. It's, it, it's you know it's, it's a byproduct no, of the story. It's news. It's news. Yeah. It's news. I always tell the story about the antitrust trial that Microsoft went through and, and how it requires someone like me who used to just write about technology to suddenly have to read up on and research and understand wanna, this bizarre topic. Want to know? Yeah. That I'm suddenly now conversant in. You know, but you don't want to know about stuff like this. But in, in this case, you have it's tr to. It's tricky for us too, as journalists, because of course we recuse ourselves from investing in tech stocks because uh, doing so would obviously bias our conflict of interest. Yeah. Be a conflict of interest. So we are intentionally ignorant. <laughs> yeah. Happily ignorant. I'll tell knowing you. Me, knowing me, if I if I could have done that, I would have put all my money in Microsoft stock. Precisely. This explains why I'm so Precisely. Still I am so grateful yeah. that, in fact, I have I told never you my, invested I, did in Did I tell stocks? you my Microsoft stock advice? Uh, my dad was uh, looking into Intel, or, um, tech stocks. Yeah, Intel was one of the ones he did invest in. And Microsoft was being sued by the U.S. government at the time for antitrust violations. And he asked me, you know, should I invest in Microsoft? And I said, Dad, this is... This is a win-win. There's no way they can lose. It's money in the this. bank, Dad. If, if Microsoft loses this case, they're going to be broken up into two or three different companies, all of which you will own stock yes. in. It will split. You're going to be it's a golden. Win, win, and if win. they win, their stock's going to go through the roof. And, of course, what happened was they settled, and their stock price has remained completely unchanged, basically unchanged, you know, ever since. I mean, it's been a complete disaster. Oops. So, fortunately, he never followed my advice. <laughs> That was wise. <clears throat> I, I, I uh, you know, you, it, it's a little hard for us in the tech uh, journalism field because, for mm -hmm. instance, you know, we're sitting there looking at Apple at 27 bucks a share. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's 10 times more. We look at Google going off on its IPO at $160. Yeah, sure. It's more than twice. And, and we look and we say, gosh, there but for... I, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, my wife is the one who handles the money and all that. And, and I, I, I don't, you know, whatever she does through... You don't want to uh, whatever, know. but we don't know. We don't own. Um, yeah, it's not like we ever bought Microsoft or Apple or no, Google. So I, no, no, no. We, I, I, I obviously can't do that. And the way I get yeah. around it, though, and the reason I know about QQQ is I, I do buy index funds, and that's yeah, why not? Index that's okay. Because that way, I don't even pay attention to what, what's in that market basket. But it's a big enough market basket that I, you know, I'm not going to say, oh, buy an Apple Mac. Well, I, so, like that's going to somehow help. Yeah, me. yeah, exactly. Yeah, my constant haranguing of Microsoft over Windows Phone is a calculated attempt by me to destroy this, you know, the stock price. So <laughs> you, you, you mock that, but there are people who have done yeah. that and gotten in a lot of yeah. trouble for it. Sure. As they should. I'm not smart enough for that. <laughs> uh, actually, speaking of antitrust, I guess Google, at least there are rumors the FTC is now investigating Google for antitrust uh, violations. Yes, the U.S. Very the U.S. Yeah. as well as the EU. Yep. Antitrust is interesting. You know, in the U.S., we have two major organizations that can launch these kind of investigations, the FTC and the U.S. Department of Justice. Uh, Microsoft last week, I, I don't remember when it happened. I assume we talked about it on the podcast, uh, filed a formal antitrust complaint against Google. Oh, we did talk about it. Yeah, the three different areas. Right. Uh, against Google in Europe. Mm -hmm. And they did it in Europe specifically because, well, A, uh, Google's already being investigated there for antitrust, but also because uh, the EU is a more sympath uh, sympathetic ear, I think for that kind of thing. And they, they proved to be very aggressive going after Microsoft, uh, more so than the U.S. government, certainly. Um, but yeah, now there's a rumor that the FTC, which was, you know, in, in the United States as well, it's worth remembering back in the 93, 94 timeframe, I think it was, 
they were the first government entity that looked into Microsoft. Eventually, the U.S. Uh, Department of Justice took the reins on that one, but it was actually the FTC that started that, uh, the original. And they, they, I think they had a uh, literally an eleventh so, hour back down. You know, does, but they were. Is, does he, so it, 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 the FTC would start the investigation, but if there were a prosecution, the DOJ would do it, or the no, FTC? no, no, either one can do it. It, oh. it, it worked out that the U.S. the uh, Federal Trade Commission. I don't remember the details, but let's say there was a vote of five people and it was three to two against going after them. It was a last minute thing and it almost happened. It was very close. And I think Bill Gates and company thought they had uh, dodged the bullet. Ooh. But then uh, I believe it was Netscape that triggered the eventual wow. one that we all know, you know, the, US, the Department of Justice. It was those guys who were talking to the government and said, look, your cohorts over there in the FTC weren't uh, manly enough to stand up to Microsoft, but maybe you guys could do it. And, and I think the DOJ was actually kind of shocked by what they saw with Microsoft. Um, and I think surprised the FTC didn't go after him, actually. Um, so, you know, we'll see. But it, it's an interesting time for Google because Google is like Microsoft compressed. You know, Microsoft rose to fame and fortune, I'd say, over a 20-year period. And Google did it in 10, you know. And they now have so much money. And uh, they're still kind of a young company. But they're transitioning more quickly into that all-too-comfortable, mature company mode. And I, I, so they're undergoing this executive switchover where one of the co-founders is now going to take over as CEO. And the guy who was CEO, Eric Schmidt, uh, is stepping down. And I, I think the expectation on the part of everyone is that he'll kind of quietly leave Google at some point. I mean, he'll probably do what he's doing right now for a little while, but... Yeah. In um, fact, supposedly he's writing a book about Google. Yes. In fact, he is co-authoring a book with uh, another executive who just announced he's leaving Google. I think Rosenberg, is, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. Yep. Yeah, would well, that be interesting? Yeah. So it's an interesting time for Google. You know, some of these things aren't necessarily related. It's just a matter of timing. But I have to give Google some credit because they're, they're at least trying to follow through on that thing that Microsoft always said they were going to do, but they never did, which was Microsoft saw that it was maturing and didn't want to turn into, in their words, the next IBM. You know, uh, although I think we have pretty successfully demonstrated some time ago that IBM, for all of its boringness to people like us who are enthusiasts is an incredibly profitable company that puts Microsoft to shame actually in that department. Um, but they're not exciting. You know, they're not innovative necessarily. They're not leading the way in any way. They're not trendsetters and all that stuff, but they're still like a ginormous company that makes oh, yeah. lots and lots of money. Boring. You know, Microsoft didn't want to become that. Microsoft in many ways has become that. I mean, obviously they have interesting little subdivisions within the company that, uh, you know, are in some ways exciting, you know, Xbox or Windows phone or whatever, but you know, by and large, is a really big company that makes money in a very traditional way, at least within the software industry. And they're trying to make this transition to cloud computing, but um, I think people still think of them as kind of an, uh, I almost said an old world company, but like an old tech company. You know, they're within the context of the tech industry, they're kind of an old company. So Google wants to avoid that fate in their words and not become the next Microsoft. That's the way they put it. But here they are, right? So they're, they're already burdened by multiple hierarchies and, and the inability to make quick decisions, which is one of the things they're trying to turn around. And now they're being investigated for antitrust on at least a couple of different fronts, you know, and you have to think there's going to be more and more of this stuff too. So it's an interesting time period for Google because it happened so quick, you know, and um, Microsoft's story is like this classic Greek tragedy of sorts. Um, I don't know what Google is yet. It's still unfolding, but it's, it's interesting just to watch it happen this quickly, you know, because 10 years ago when Microsoft had their own problems, Google was nothing, you know, they were absolutely nothing. And the world has changed very quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's tech. Yeah. That's tech. Yeah. Uh, actually, it's funny you say that. I, I, I had a meeting with Microsoft coincidentally, and, and <clears throat> one of the guys said, uh, you know, not, not that he invented the quote, but he said, you know, it's a famous quote that, if you don't like change, yeah, you know you're in the wrong industry. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that, that this is what this is all about. And if you don't like the way it is, hang out for a few minutes because yeah, it's, it's going to change. Different. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, and I think that people like us who um, cover this industry yeah. love change. I mean, we surf I the wave. It. You Hate fear it. change. I I, uh, I don't understand why you're so unhappy, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. What is is it always like this? Or? <laughs> It's it's gonna slow down, right? Because no, no it's gonna. That's what's amazing is it's gonna speed up. It's only the beginning. Yeah, and at some point, I'm sure I will go. Okay, it's scary now. I I gotta stop. 
But but for something there is, I think that's why so many ADD people are in this business uh, because we need to. Come, we're always looking. Oh, what's next? What's next? What's next? We never uh, get bored. Yeah. You never get bored. Uh, it's it's not boring. That's for not sure. Not boring. I, um, yeah, eventually though, I'm gonna. Yeah, there's a rebellion that occurs. I'm gonna go back to my StarTac phone and yeah, uh, just give up. You know. Well, like I remember. <laughs> I you know I won't name names, but there were people I worked with at Ziff Davis, for instance, not at, not at Tech TV, but in the magazine part. Who said I can't take this anymore? I am so burned out. I it's completely it. understandable. I, I I would not. I would not give anyone a hard time for that. No, I, mean, I didn't. I, I think, said I, I'm I think with you. Past a certain age, too. You know, enough, right? Enough. I, when I, I, I believe me, as soon as I hit forty, it's I'm getting out of the business. Yeah. <laughs> I had moments just from a programming standpoint. I think I might have told the story. You know, I was a programmer and a developer, and it it was XML. It was my line where that I said enough. enough. I, I could take the like the utter and pointless proliferation of 200 different C-like languages and, and navigate between the differences between them all. Okay, that I can handle. I don't understand it, but I get it. Or I could do it. But then XML came out and Microsoft was working on that XAML stuff and that uh, well, the, you know, declare you, the programming you, That's problem. why you got burned out, because you, instead of following in what was going on in the industry standards, you followed yeah. what was going on with Microsoft yeah, standards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Woo! You had, Microsoft uh, was the, the home of the data access routine of the week. And, you know? Oh, yeah. my God. Corba and oh, ADO, my God. ADO, oh. ADO Plus, RDO. Yeah, it just went on and on. I, that, truthfully, I think that's probably when I kind of lost interest in Microsoft. It's like I couldn't – it was like, okay, I, I'll wait till you figure out what you want to do. And then <laughs> and then as soon as you do, let me, let me know. Let me know, let me know when that happens. Yeah, let me uh, know. When, and they, and they, still, never, they never did. You still have trouble with your desktop. Yep, still can't. <laughs> Saved my – Desktop, desktop. Oh, well. um, <laughs> let's take a break and because uh, you've got the Windows tip of the week. Yep. You've got yeah, your lots app. of picks and apps and lots stuff. of stuff. Uh, but I do, hey, by the way, Lou M.M., who is a Microsoft developer for the last eight years, says, now you know how we feel. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. Your life must be hell. I'm sorry. <laughs> I do confess. I must I be. I would like to be. I must I'm be sorry. getting on that. The beginning of that edge, because lately, and, and I think this is telling, I've started to fantasize mm -hmm. about buying a boat and yeah. sailing around the world. Right. And now that sounds like, you know, it's a normal midlife crisis fantasy for any yeah. red-blooded yeah, yeah. American male. Of course, there's yep. young ladies on the boat with me in bikinis, but that we won't mention that. But, but what serving I, drinks. Serving drinks with little umbrellas. But what mm -hmm. I will say that perhaps uh, is telling here, and... And, and the brain knows, even if it's not forefront, is there's no internet. There's no computers. Yeah. You're yeah. sailing around the world. You're disconnected. No cell phones. And yeah. I think that must be really the appeal of that. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah. I wonder if Ford makes boats. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, you know, my uh, uncle, who was a, a car mechanic, was a Volvo guy. He always owned boats. He has a place on a lake. Oh, I love boats. His boats always had Volvo engines oh, in them. So I can I can assure you and this is possible. Or owned Volvo anyway. I don't know. I think they, yeah. they, uh, they dis disengage. Hey, let's talk about Audible.com because you and I are both big Audible fans. In fact, um, I talked to Audible the other day and they said, you know who we like having ads on with you and Paul because you guys love Audible so much that it really carries a lot of weight. We always try to really stick with advertisers we use, we know. And boy, there's no question in my mind, or I'm sure Paul's or Andy's or many of the other hosts, Brian Brushwood, who, you, who use Audible, that we just love, love audible.com. You, you could try it free for, uh, get the first book free. You get a month of the uh, gold account at audible.com slash windows. The challenge, of course, is there's 80,000 titles here. This is a huge bookstore now. The new oh. Tina Fey book is out. She narrates her story. It's, uh, it's called Bossy Pants. <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah. You're gonna pass on that. No, I, I knew that that's, wasn't for you. That's not. You, Paul, reads two kinds of books. He reads deep history books, or he reads thrillers. <laughs> which, like that's which do we have this yeah. week? Uh, history. Yeah, actually, See? I so. love history too. I'm with you. What you read? Well, actually, you know, this one's a little old. I've, 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 <laughs> I've kind of moved on since I recommended it. It doesn't have to be that. something you're reading right now. I mean, it's just something you recommend. Yeah, yeah, you know. It, um, it's called The Longest War, America and Al-Qaeda Since 9-11 uh, by Peter Bergen. And it's basically, you know, 10 years after the fact, looking back on, you know, uh, how the world's changed, especially, you know, obviously from the United States perspective. Right, right. Um, 
you know, since that time. It's, it's, um, there's some it's really, really good yeah. books on this subject, actually. Yeah, 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 yeah. I've read a number I, of these, and it's fascinating to hear, you know, yeah, this is a, this is a really good one. And I, I, you know, as is the case with the Microsoft stuff, you know, when the Microsoft antitrust trial was all the rage, all these books came out about Microsoft, you know, of course, because they were in the news. And obviously, 9 11 being a historical event and a huge event. Uh, in the couple of years right after, there were a lot of books about, you know, the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. And, you know, this is how we get to know what's going on in the secret war and all that stuff. And I think what's interesting about this is because this is the book version of, um, you know, a look back, you know, after with some perspective. And I think that's why it's important. You know, news happens and you can report on it immediately. And then, you know, a newspaper the next day might have a nice wrap up. And then we used to have really good news weeklies that... A week later would have, you know, even more perspective, Those you know, that gone. kind of thing. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's just another story I've been meaning to write forever. But anyway, for right now, uh, this is, I, I think the thing that is really interesting about this, aside from the fact that the topic is interesting, is just that we can now look at this with a little bit of perspective. And it's tough because, frankly, this stuff has not really been resolved, has it? So. No. Well, yeah. this was a, 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 lest you think this is an old book, it's brand new, it just came out. In fact, Amazon. That's what I mean. This is, yeah, no, this yeah. is 10 years in, right? This yeah. is brand new. Yeah. Yeah. Amazon gave it their uh, book of the month for uh, January, mm. so it, uh, this is, okay. just, just came out. Uh, Peter Bergen, The Longest War, America and Al-Qaeda Since 9-11. And that's one of the things I think that sounds interesting about this book. It also talks about wh what's happened to Al-Qaeda, how it has changed since 9-11. Uh, yeah, and it, you know, this, it's funny if you're following the news in the Middle East now, you know, there is some debate about whether this revolution-mindedness uh, that's really engulfing the region is going to benefit them or take away from them, you know, right. or detract from them. It's, uh, there's a lot of interesting debates to be had around uh, what's going on. But anyway, we're, we're living in the middle of history, so obviously it's an evolving story. Fascinating story, yeah. Yeah. Well, you can get this for free, or but there are that, that's history. There's fiction, nonfiction, science fiction, classics, uh, business books, all kinds of books, even books for young adults and uh, kids. So, uh, which I think, by the way, getting a kid into reading by getting him an Audible subscription is a brilliant ploy. They'll never know they're actually reading, you know. And nowadays, I think kids are so used to watching that, that giving them something like this where the, the book really plays itself out in their mind uh, is a great way to get kids into literature. I'll tell you, it got me back into literature. I can now, I, I now have time to read because I can read in the car, at the gym, while I'm doing the laundry. Mm -hmm. audible.com slash windows first pick your book then go there sign up for the gold account first month is free you get to cancel at any time and the book is yours to keep forever plays on the ipod the zune the kindle most devices even gps devices uh, many of them play audible audible.com slash windows we thank them for their support of windows weekly you know i forget that audible is an amazon company it says so now on the masthead and i forgot you know i mean i know but i I forget, and and in a way, you kind of see where this is going, right? I I've actually seen recently more links to Audible stuff on Amazon.com, exactly. which I find very interesting yep. because when you go to buy a book, obviously you have different editions of the book, you know, hardcover, softcover, maybe there's a large printed version, whatever. There, if there's a Kindle version, they'll have a link to that, and now they link to the Audible versions as well, so you, you can search for a book on Amazon and buy it from Audible through Amazon. Of course, you know they're the same company, I guess, but. It's a nice little bit of information. We have a listener in the chat room. Ricardo mm -hmm. Shinsky says, I haven't signed up for Audible because I don't know which show I want to get the credit for it. Right. May I make a plug for this <laughs> good-looking lug right here? Just use audible.com slash windows so Paul gets credit for it. Yes, Paul. Paul Therott. You know, you've heard of him. <laughs> hey, let's get our Windows uh, 7 phone 7 phone phone 7 app. Mm. Pick of the okay. phone seven week. I think, did <laughs> what, I get too many wait, what, am, what am I doing? <laughs> now right. I'm confused. But. Let's get the phone tip. Or phone okay. app. Phone no, app. wait a minute. You wanted to do, I'm sorry, I scrolled down. You wanted to, I, what was that's at the very bottom. You've got like 18 tips in here. I, know, I, I don't know what's going on this week. I'm sorry. Uh, Windows weekly tip of the week. This is just a generic it's just one. a tip. This is about cloud backup. You know, now that the final version of Windows Home Server is out, one of the things I'm looking at is uh, automated cloud backup for the server. It's expensive, and there aren't that many choices. Um, I'm probably going to go with Keep Vault, although I'm curious if anyone has any opinions about that. Unfortunately, for a server operating system, 
uh, these things tend to be more expensive. The nice thing is if you're just a normal person with a normal computer, which I hope you are, uh, it can be cheaper. And I think we all know there's all kinds of different uh, services that do cloud backup. And I'll write up something about this tip and I'll list a bunch of them there. But I'm particularly, uh, particularly interested to see if anyone has any tips uh, for me, actually, about server backup uh, to the cloud, like Keep Vault is, is the one I'm investigating. So I'm going to throw a few on there for now. And then, like I said, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to blow away the server. Uh, but one of the things I do intend to do is regularly backup. So it looks like the going rate for server backup, you know, for the pro version of these services or whatever, is about a dollar a gigabyte per year. That's so not bad. It's not bad, but if you have 300 gigabytes, it's 300 bucks a year. So obviously it's worth it if it's important to you. So, you know, the, the truth is, you know, that's uh, that's where you go to someone like uh, Carbonite, where they have a flat mm -hmm. rate. And uh, but, exactly right. Yeah. And I can't use something like that for the server stuff. So that's right. why I'm. Yeah, so I'm is this does this only go to the server? Uh, does it go? No, no, they have a they have a cloud have a, as well. Uh, it's cloud-based. In other words, you can back I up see. from a PC. That's the consumer version, whatever they call it. Oh, they and have then a they pro, have, pro server version. That's what uh, you want because you're ba it's so easy to back up to the Windows home server or a NAS. Yeah. But then that's not enough because if the house burns down, you don't have a backup of the backup. So that's why you need kind of both. So I think that's a good a good. I'm very, very curious yeah, to you, hear what no, you you Obviously, you, sh you should and can back up to a USB hard drive in your house. and That's fine. Or to a NAS device or whatever yeah, or it is. Windows home server. But that doesn't yeah. help you when your house burns down. Yeah. So... Off-site backup, if it's important, and I would argue that it, this applies to everybody. If you have photos, which I think we all do, or home movies of your child, you know, when they're a baby, uh, that's it's the type of stuff you don't important. want to lose. It's you know? important, absolutely. Yeah, so backup, uh, off-site backup is important. Now, I have work and home stuff, so it's doubly important. Or, you know. Well, yeah, those of us who work at home or have our own businesses, boy, I mean, yeah. uh, it's not just kid pics. I just want it to be automated. I do a lot of herky-jerky stuff around copying photos up to places and stuff like that. And it works, but I, I'd like this to be automated. So I, think I have set it up totally automated. So um, I use on every computer, it has a backup thing that runs in the middle of the night, and it backs up to the NAS, and then the NAS is continually backing up to the cloud. And if it doesn't do yeah. that, you know, I don't feel safe. I just, because I will right. forget. Yep. Yeah, ah. right. that's exactly right. Windows 7 application <laughs> <laughs> so i talked about log me and ignition and as expected got a lot of email from people who either disagreed with my choice or actually some of them turned me on turned me on to something i hadn't i was aware of but i guess i didn't quite understand what the yeah, point log of it me was. And bought this company yeah and it's called uh log me and hamachi which is a, a vpn service it's free for individuals and actually it works really really well the only thing I, i'm going to test before i write it up is the performance compared to other things. So w what I use it for, and I did, I've tested this out in, uh, in the world, which is kind of neat, which is, you know, you take your laptop out of the house and you go on a work trip, or I went into Boston the other day for a meeting. So I'm on the train coming home and the train has Wi-Fi. And so what happens is you can connect to the VPN and then whatever, whatever other computers on your home network are also connected to the VPN now show up in the network interface in Windows 7 as if you were on the home network, right? Because it's a VPN, you're tunneling into your home network. So I set up uh, this on my home server and I was able to drag and drop files through the normal Explorer interface, which is actually pretty cool. So to kind of step back a bit, you know, when we talk about remote access, you know, there, there are basically two types. I mean, there's the FTP style fi file copy type stuff, uh, which I use through LogMeIn. And then there's the uh, remote desktop interface. We, we're using a device or a computer or a web browser or whatever it is. You, you remotely log into your computer and then you interact with it over the internet as if you were sitting in front of it, right? And this is a third type, right? It's a, really just a regular VPN. And it gives you the ability to navigate through Explorer and hit those folders and shares and things on the server or on another PC as if you were literally on that home network. So it's actually pretty exciting. It seems to work really well. It's free. And again, the only question I have is the performance. So what I'm going to do is get off of my network and then I'll do some file copies uh, of the things I usually copy when I'm on the road, things like photos and document sets and so forth. And I'll do them both ways, you know, through the LogMeIn interface and through the LogMeIn Hamachi interface, just to see how they, you know, compare. I think you'll uh, be pleased. Yeah. Steve and I did a show on Hamachi before mm -hmm. LogMeIn bought it. 
And okay. It's just the coolest thing ever. It I, is. It's, 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 yeah. By the way, seeing this stuff, appear, I, I've used VPNs before, so I shouldn't be like a little kid about this, but honestly. No, no, but this is more. This is more. It's really neat. Yeah. Yeah. It, it works really well. Yeah. Steve gave it a two thumbs up. Uh, I think they kind of, they, they, um, you know, it messed it up a little bit with Logman because you can't buy, you know, you used to be able to run your own Hamachi server and there was all sorts of neat things you could do, but still very, very cool, I think. Yeah, it's really nice. Logmein.com. Yep. Uh, and your Windows Phone 7 app pick, finally. <laughs> Actually, it's just the first of many. Yeah, I have two, yeah. So this one I just had to throw in there because it this it's a new uh, Xbox Live game called... Uh, Fable Coin Golf. Fable being the name of a... I like Fable, but I didn't know they had uh, a golf version. Yeah, like an RPG type game yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Coin Golf, it, it's just like a little... I don't even know how to describe it. It is literally the most fun game I've ever played on a phone. It, really? it is. I, it sounds dumb, but the, the graphics are gorgeous. It, it's, it's sort of set up like you're in a room and this is like a, like a pinball type machine. And it's sort of, so it's like a 3D environment, and it scrolls around the machine a little bit in a way that is very reminiscent of a high-end gaming console. It's just a, a really nice use of 3D and hardware accelerated graphics and everything. It's beautiful looking. And the game has, you know, it's a physics-based game. You kind of move a puck around, and you uh, navigate around little creatures and obstacles and so forth. But it, it's got a medieval kind of feel to it, so it takes place in a forest, and there's little, you know, like ogres and orcs and stuff. It is amazingly addictive and it is <laughs> it, it is a it. it is a fantastic game it, it is absolutely great it's um it's five dollars so it's it's kind of expensive within the context of a of a phone game but i i really you can try it obviously windows phone you can try it before you buy so give it a shot and before you pay for it but i i'm just really impressed by how awesome it is and if you're a fable fan which i'm not the the gold you earn in the game in this game goes toward your character in Fable 3. So See, you actually win... that's smart, because that gets yeah. people to play Fable. Right. So there's a tie-in, right? So yeah. it's, it's a weak tie-in, but I, presumably the, the way they set this up is that your character in the game Fable has walked into a tavern, yeah. and now this is the game, and you can win money playing it, and that's how, you know, I guess that's the <laughs> silly little, uh, <laughs> you know, the tie-in. But it doesn't matter. I, I don't play Fable, so I don't really care about that bit of it, but I am really... You will, Paul. You will. Okay. I'm really impressed by this game. It's a, just a neat, neat game. Well, so. And it's not on iPhone, and it's not as far as I can tell. Right, and that's actually kind of nice because, you know, unfortunately, Windows Phone being the late to the market thing that it is, a lot of the games and applications I mention each week are, you know, games that, you know, people with an iPhone are like, yeah, that's cute, Paul. We had that we've three had, years ago. Yeah, we've had that for a long time. Um, you know, and, and obviously some apps and games are important enough that you want to mention them anyway because they're, they're a big deal regardless. Like, uh, for example... Super Monkey Ball just came out on Windows Phone this week as well. It's a oh, good game. man. I was just waiting. Good game. You know, the, the new version, there's a newer game out on iPhone and Android, I'm sure. But uh, it's a big deal. But still, I, I feel Fable Coin Golf is a much better game, actually, and, and, and unique to the platform. So cool. definitely check it out if you have Windows Phone. It's, it's really, it's surprisingly good. I got to get my Windows Phone back from Tony. <laughs> he loves it. Of course he does. It's awesome. He loves it. It's awesomeness. Awesome sauce. App number so, two for your phone. Yeah, so I have two. I, you know, I, I wanted to turn my attention a little bit more toward apps uh, or other solutions that uh, overcome some of the uh, deficiencies in Windows Phone. So this is sort of in that vein. And that is that Windows Phone doesn't natively support YouTube, although Microsoft and or I don't know who made it, but Microsoft published it. I believe that there's an official YouTube app that is pretty horrible, actually. Uh, there's a third-party version of YouTube, of, of the app, available on Windows Phone now. So if you go into the app marketplace and you search for YouTube, you'll see two apps, the Microsoft one and the other one. And the other one is the one you want. Uh, this is an amazing application, really, really well done. It kind of goes its own way in the UI, you know, in the sense that you can scrub through a video and so forth. And the controls look a little different maybe than the native Windows Phone controls. It doesn't matter. This is a, This is a, you know... Mobile YouTube is what it is, but I, you know, I was at the Celtics game the other night with my brother, and he reminded me of something I wanted to show him, and I could pull this thing up, and even he looked at it, he's like, wow, that looks, <laughs> like, that's really nice looking. It was just a, it's a pretty impressive little app, so this is a nice way to work around the uh, lack of YouTube or good YouTube on Windows Phone, so um, another one you should check out. 
And as if you weren't getting enough value for your money on this show, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we are not done yet, my friends. No, we're not. There's yet another pick, your mobile app pick of the week. Yeah. So when I, when I announced, I guess, that I was going to be doing these mobile app picks, I was going to specifically apps for non-Microsoft platforms, but apps that would integrate in some ways with Windows or Microsoft software. Um, the number one recommendation I got was for TeamViewer, which yes, I had looked yes. at before, and it, it had been a while. So um, uh, that is actually the pick this week, and it, it is very, very good. I, but it's kind of comparable to log me in, right? Yeah, with two there. So two exceptions. Uh, it is a what I think of as a traditional remote desktop solution, i.e., it is designed to provide you with the desktop of that computer you're connecting to. Right? It's not a FTP interface. It's the desktop. And, I, and again, I think that's what most people think of when they think of remote desktop, that they want that desktop. So it's there. Uh, and it works. It works fine. You can, you can, it works on the iPad, which I tested it on. It works on iPhone and I, iPod Touch, obviously. Android. It works from Windows to Windows. You can do this application. You can do it go through Windows. It will work uh, via the web, which Logman does as well. So it's a web interface, and that's nice. It's free for personal use, and that's great. So I think for most people who are listening to this, if that's what you want, remote desktop that crosses uh, firewalls and, and goes across the Internet, uh, this will work really well. The problem is it's, you can't install it on the server. It actually sees Windows Home Server as a server, which it is. Um, so it, it, you would have to pay for it if you wanted to use it with the server. Um, that's probably not going to be a problem for everybody, but it was a bit of a problem for me because that's how I would typically want to use it. I'm, I'm never going to want a remote desktop into my desktop. It, when I'm out on the road, if I'm on a business trip, if I'm in Boston at a meeting or whatever it is, and I need something, uh, at home, it's always on the server. And, and I think you know, you're unique. I don't think that's typical. I think that's... Right, and that's why I'm saying this, yeah. because I think for most people, this is exactly what you're looking for. Yeah. And it works really, really well. I, th there's some... It's an interesting thing where I, I thought it was going to be more complex than it was because when you set up an account, obviously you log in with a username and a password. And what that will do is give you a list of the computers that you have registered uh, with the software. And that's fine. But they, they, they have this interesting extra step where you can supply, they, they, they supply uh, a numerical or an alphanumerical title to each machine as well. And it's actually possible to log on to the service and provide that information and just get directly to the machine. And it seems like a confusing extra step, but I think they do it for people who want to do um, support type work, where you don't want them to have access to your account, but you do want to give them at least temporary access to your machine. So you may be on the phone with them and they're trying to help you out. And with this information, they can over the internet log on to your machine. And the other thing that happens is when you do this interactively like that, you, as the owner of the machine, if you're sitting in front of it, have the opportunity, as, as in other solutions, to cut them off at any time. So if you see them, you know, select all, moving into the trash, you know, you can prevent them from doing that. So it seems like a nice little solution. It's, it's well thought out. There's a pro version and all that stuff. But it supports all the major mobile platforms. It's free. And I think that kind of makes it uh, qualify as a good choice for this kind of thing. So it does work very well, definitely. Cool. Yeah. Well, I think we should just stop here. <laughs> okay, that's convenient because I'm actually out of stuff. <laughs> Woo. Wow, was that a jam-packed show or what, kids? Paul Therott, editor-in-chief of the Supersite for Windows. A lot of this is on winsupersite.com. Actually, let me ask you, I'm, I'm concerned. Did I not, I, I don't know if I mentioned Apple enough. Is there some kind of uh, oh, Yeah, I think you're going you're gonna to get in trouble with the, uh, <laughs> we could, we could, the fans. They say, well, wait highlight. a minute, where's your iPad review? Right. No, I don't think we mentioned Apple much. Yeah, sorry about thing. that. A good thing. <laughs> Although, hey, I'm getting the BlackBerry Playbook in about uh, a week. Maybe I'll. Sh maybe I'll uh, I'm very that. curious to see that. Although, you know, when I think about these tablets, I have to say, uh, the more and more I, I keep coming back to the same thing, which is simply, you know, the hardware can be great, the battery life can be great, all that kind of stuff can be great. But if you don't have the apps, yep. and if you don't have the access to the content, yep. It becomes less interesting, yeah. you know, and so we'll see. I'm I'm very curious to see the playbook. I think this is going to be a contender, but I just keep coming back to the same thing. You know, for normal people, it's pretty much the iPad. I don't understand, I you know, the Zoom or the you know the other stuff. Well, we've like, played with the Zoom a bunch now, and I think a uh, clear not not a not a contender. Really? Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Then why is that? Uh, well, there's actually some severe bugs in Honeycomb. Google, yeah, Google surprise, has pulled surprise, it back yeah. and said, well, yeah. we rushed it, and they did. And yeah. it, there's, there's hesitancy and stuff. There's weird things happen. Uh, it's pretty heavy. 
Um, it doesn't. It's not got a right. great screen either. I think, boy, it really, um, uh, when you look at it and then you go back to the iPad, it's like, wow, this really is a good screen on the iPad. Right. That's important. It is important. Um, but I, I did play a little bit with the playbook when uh, we had it for Regis and Kelly and at CES. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I, I thought that this was a decent shot. And of course, they're going to run Android software in emulation on it. Um, so I'll be very curious. And I like the 7-inch screen. I think that that's kind of nice. It's a little more compact. Anyway, it's, it's our job. We buy these things. We bought a Zoom. <laughs> Yep, uh, yep. And uh, we'll buy a playbook. I did order it anyway, and I think it comes in the 19th. I, I think for me personally, because of the Microsoft focus, there was a, you know, it's a little bit of a problem when you think about there's going to be all these Android tablets. There's uh, the yeah. HP thing, which is yeah. Palm OS, um, playbook. These are all different OSs. So, like, where, you know, I, I think it's uh, unfortunately the reality yeah. is, I, like I said, for the reasons I said before, I don't see any way to recommend any of these other things. No, even no without to. Even without seeing them, and that. I think I'm going to have to focus on that and then also, you know, whatever viable Windows tablets ever come down the road. But, man, it might be, you know, it might be a year before right. there's one of those. Apple has so a I guess good I can, head start on this one. Yeah, I guess I can save some money that way. But Well, you, we'll buy it so you don't have to. <laughs> okay. Really, that's my attitude yeah. is we yeah. kind of have yeah. to. Um, sure. It kind of feeds my interest in what's new. Sure. And I oh, don't no, have that issue. Just from a, a purely enthusiast uh, standpoint, yeah, right, I am interested, but I, I just can't justify no. it, and I just don't. I just don't see the need. I am not going to use it personally. So what's the difference? Right, exactly. We hand it around. Different shows use it. That kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, Win Super Sight. Oh, I know what I was going to say. Next week mm -hmm. is uh, the National Association of oh, Broadcasters. Right. We'll be live uh, Monday through Wednesday, but I'll be back in time to do this show. Believe it or not. No, uh, we're going to do it at the show. We're going to do, do it at Wednesday. the show. Yep. Even Wednesday better. Wednesday at 11, 11 a.m. Right. South Hall. <laughs> I knew that. 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern. Yep. Uh, you can watch live. We're going to stream it live from the National and, Association. And let me tell you something. Thank God we're doing this because that night I'm flying red eye home. Oy. And I would be a basket case on Thursday. So. And you're out there not for uh, the uh, NAB show, but for... For Mix, the Mix. Microsoft show. So yeah. what we'll have is a lot of information from Mix. Uh, yeah, next, next and there will be, I think. I think we're going to see some good stuff around uh, Windows Phone and around Silverlight. Um, I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be good. Do you have a date yet for PDC or is that, uh, has it been announced? Mm, I don't know if they've announced. I'm thinking September, October, somewhere in that time frame. That'll be fun. That'll, be the, that'll be the public beta, you know, Windows 8. Windows that, 8. So. Wow. Or not the public, the private, but at least the, you know, they'll announce First it and we'll have, them. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Winsupersite.com. Uh, of course, don't forget Paul's great books, Windows 7 Secrets and Windows Phone Secrets, both available in bookstores now. Paul Therat is blinking. And that <laughs> blinking. means it's blinking. Oh, my light is, is it really? Is it? Yeah. No, I just did I wasn't it. Looking. I just did it. So I changed the setting and it's still doing it. I, I can't explain it. There's nothing flashing in here. I don't know why. I don't know. It's like I'm in front of a, you know, like a strobe light. Yeah, it does look like your screen goes on, but you're saying Maybe it's, it's not it. Maybe it's a stupid camera. I'll just... I'm telling you, Logitech C510, best camera. C510. Yeah, 69 bucks. We'll pay for it. We'll send you one. Send me a camera, Leo. Send you a camera. You can hand me a camera. I'm going to see you next week. I'll hand you a camera. <laughs> see you next week on Windows Weekly. I'll see you next week. No, I'll see you next week. <laughs> <laughs>